So hello, please take your seat. The doors are closed. And I have to admit, it is still an impressive crowd. We didn't lose too many on the sides here since last uh, Wednesday. Hello, and I'm happy to see you all here for the closing session. And not being a native speaker, I would have printed Lifetime Together, so it is a Lifetime Achievement Award. I thought it's a Lifetime Achievement Award, whatever it is. So, no, and we are very, very happy that we have the colleagues here, which we, um, we are so proud that we have five of our long-term EASA supporting colleagues who we nominated for the EASA Lifetime Award. And they did accept. These personalities will be presented to you by colleagues which know the nominees since years and developed a personal friendship. So I asked Christa Larsen to bring Life Blomquist to your mind, who unfortunately could not make it himself to Essence due to a health problem. I myself remember him always as Mr. Snow Leopard, but I'm sure that Christa will present more from his personality. Thank you. First of all, I would like to give you some words directly from Leif. And he says, Dear EASA colleagues, I want to express my sincere thanks to EASA for honoring me with the EASA Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm deeply grateful for getting this very special award. I want to express my thanks, especially to my colleagues in the Felly Tag, Small Carnivore Tag, and the Deer Tag. Without the encouragement and support from my colleagues in these tags, I would not have been able to fulfill my duties as EP coordinator, ESB stud bookkeeper, and international stud bookkeeper. <coughs> Sorry. My very special thanks I want to address to Laurie Bingham Lackley, who throughout all the years always has been my safe backup in providing me advices and support and helping me with problems popping up when entering data into Sparks. I'm convinced that I here speak on behalf of a number of other stud bookkeepers as well. Thank you, Laurie, for your incredible patience and your quick reactions to all my emergency calls. I'm also indebted to my directors, first in Helsinki Zoo, and later on in Nordens Ark, who have understood the importance of stud bookkeeping and permitted me to reserve some of my office time for stud bookkeeping. Without your support, my work would have been much more difficult to fulfill. Thank you also to everybody who has supported me for this year's EASA Lifetime Achievement Award, LEIF. I'm, I'm sure you will bring the EASA Lifetime Achievement Award back to him. I will. And uh, with uh, our sincere greetings and thankfulness from the, all the association, and we would uh, like that you bring it to him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was asked to say something about Leif, and um, I would prefer to say something to Leif instead. Um, I think he will watch us now. I hope he will watch us now. He had a surgery on his back uh, Tuesday, and I had a, not a conversation, because it was a very short SMS from him. I am recovering, so he is probably okay. 
Um, so to Leif, you have meant a lot to me and to mother, many other people in this room. I know that there are a number of people attending the ASA conferences that whatever you like it or not, Leif, consider you as their mentor. To know you, Leif, has for me been like a passport or a fast lane into the zoo world. Wherever I have met people working with animals, from Crane Foundation in Wisconsin to Singapore Zoo, everybody seems to know you. The wolverine man, the forest reindeer man, but also, of course, most of all, the snow leopard man. People know about you and remember you as a trustworthy and serious fellow, always ready to help when it comes to animal questions. They remember and appreciate you as a stud book keeper, as an EP coordinator. They remember you as deeply involved in establishing the regional collection plan for small carnivore and to support the work with the European mink, just to name a few things. The best example for me uh, is where I work at Nordens Ark. We would not have been where we are today without your help. You supported us during the very first years when nobody has even heard of us. You came to us and worked full time for a period in the beginning, 30 years ago. After this, you have been a part time member of our staff until just recently. Your knowledge, contacts, and spirit meant and meant a lot to Norden Sark and to our staff. Thank you, Leif. You have earned this award and make sure to recover quickly from your surgery. Thank you. This was the first one who couldn't make it, and now the second one. It's in his, uh, she's in the room, but she doesn't know about it. I speak of a person which was very familiar to me even since my keeper time at Cologne Zoo in the beginning of the 1990s. 1980s, I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so it is Lydia Kolter and Rosie Koch. And Rosie Koch is highlighting her immense input to our community. You know, Lydia, we just had um, the, sn the snow leopard man, and I think you are the bear woman. Please. <laughs> You know, over 30 years, you've worked for a conservation through joint management of captive populations. You were keeping data about Przewalski horses, and you were the first ones to give breeding recommendations. And mind you, that was in a, in a time that it was still questionable, over 30 years ago. So I think that, and not only me, I was not the only one to... Um, to put you forward. It was also Berthe Boer and Frank Rietkerk. And we are really convinced that you were very important to get this joint effort conservation by um, joint breeding is, while well, you were the, the, the force behind this. And then of course I know you from the Bear Tech. You know, she's been tech chair for so many, so many years. And she has run the EEP of the Sun Bear, the EEP of the Andean Bear. And she is so dedicated. I sometimes think that she knows every bear by heart. Maybe even the stat book numbers. <laughs> and Lydia, how do you do that? Well, you're inspiring. You're critical. Persuasive. You're good-natured and you have a good sense of humor. And you know what the good thing is about you, what makes you such an excellent person, and why, why 
you really deserve this Lifetime Achievement Award, is that you never put yourself in the picture. You're a biologist per sang. I hope you like it. I hope it was worth the travel from Ljubljana starting three o'clock this morning. <laughs> now face a very rare event in connection with me. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And I want to thank Thomas Kaufels, all of you that you supported me in all these years, and especially Jose. Jose and me often act like twins. We, have, we are faced with a certain problem and we, in general, come always to the same solution. And, yeah, and uh, I really also liked very much the cooperation with you, and I hope that we can go on uh, in bare work, because I'm still doing quite some voluntary work. Now a little bit on another stage, but perhaps I come back from time to time <laughs> to this stage. Thank you very much. The next award nominee, I suppose, was under, underestimated by most of the silverbacks in the early years of EASA. The former ISIS, or ISIS better, representative Nate Flatness worked his way through the reserved attitude to IT necessity in this generation of zoo directors. Leslie Dickey will praise his efforts for our community. Thank you, Thomas. I have to take my glasses off to read now, I'm so old. So we are here to honour a man whose lifetime's work impacts our work every single day. Nates began his career in zoos in 1974. Now many of you in the audience would have been like me, a toddler at that time, and some of you would simply have been a twinkle in a stud book coordinator's eye. A stud book that could not have been managed without Nate. Nate continued to work for our community until 2017, that's 43 years in service to our community. It was in 1974 that Nate teamed up with Yuli Seal to establish what we now know to be the standards for captive animal data management. It also heralded a new era of collaboration between zoos, collaboration that we now, most of the time, take for granted. Nate established the only pooled medical records for exotic animals and defined the standards of practice for veterinary medical records. There are now more than 74 million animal health records, which we can use and pool to understand health norms for thousands of species in our care. Again, perhaps we take for granted, but it's 74 million records, and Nate brought that about. We now have a knowledge of more than 10 million individual animals, a database unlike any other that we can use for multiple studies in longevity, fecundity, genetics, and many more. Perhaps we take that for granted. The record system that Nate created is the bedrock for the management of our populations and supports the various forms of managed programs around the world. It supports detailed academic inquiry and it also supports it, the more local inquiry. I recently had to look up our first gorilla. Um, she was called Mpongo, M1 in our records, Mammal 1. It took me about a minute to have her entire life history in front of me. So not only has he given us information, I think he saved us time. Now, due, due to Nate's own longevity, he went through all the systems of data management from punch cards 
young people in the audience, find an older person to tell you about that. From punch cards to DOS to Windows desktop to the fully online single record system that we use today. That Nate is a patient man, we know. He probably brought about as much care and enthusiasm to those punch cards as he does to the system today. In the process, of course, of trying to create this giant collaborative data system, he did something else. He built, first as the director of ISIS, then the first director of science, what is effectively the world's largest zoo association. It has a thousand members in 90 countries. It's had its ups and downs, but it's always had the steadying presence of Nate. So these are all amazing attributes, and it's why we're honoring Nate today. But to sum up, I want to add something else about Nate that I think deserves recognition. I think I first met Nate in Taipei in 2004. Um, he welcomed me, was interested, encouraging to my younger, naive self. Nate Flesness is a nice man. He's a kind man, a generous man. He's a gentleman. Now, words like nice and kind are underrated, but actually they're really important and they're really good words. I have seen him always give his time generously, including to so many students eager to learn. He has spent his time promoting and supporting zoos in a world that sometimes does not appreciate us. He has joined with us with good spirit and an open outlook throughout that 43 years. So to this nice, kind, generous, deeply modest, and I would say quietly visionary man, it gives me utmost pleasure in presenting you, Nate, with the IASA Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. I'm honored beyond words by that introduction. Um, I have a lot of stories from 40 years. The good news is most of them can't be told in public, so I'll see you in the bar. Um, <clears throat> it's been the honor of a lifetime to help build an international network that served you. Um, when I walked into Species 360, there were then called ISIS, there were two chairs and I sat in one of them. The staff was two and the membership was 85. I'll take a moment to call out Jersey, Copenhagen and London, which were the first three zoos outside of North America to join the network. I found a grant that year, my first year, went to visit them and asked them why in the world were they members? And they said because they hoped everyone else would be. It took a little while. <clears throat> We grew at two institutions a month, and for years people said, what good is this? It's only got 150 members. It's only got 300 members. It's only got 500 members. At two institutions a month, or about 25 a year, it'll take forever. Why don't you quit? I'm a member of the long-run political party. In the long run, the long run happens. Forty years later, we've added 1,000. I encourage you to be a member of the long-run party. Um, Leslie already covered the things that we've done. There's some more things to do, so you should make sure this network serves you going forward. It's their wonderful veterinary database. We can tell you about all kinds of things vets do. We just can't tell you yet which ones work best. That seems kind of important to me, so we ought to get on and finish that part. Similarly, it's got lots of pedigrees. They ought to be a little better. That would require bringing in third-party data. Hope you get on to that part. The biggest reward to me, and I appreciate this award very much, thank you, has been all the people I've gotten to know, dedicated, passionate, kind, generous, a little crazy maybe, um, and all over the world. Um, that was an unexpected career for someone that came from where I did, and it's been an honor. Thank you again.
Now, a hero of my early EASA life will now present it to you by Simon Tang. Nick Lindsay from Zoological Society of London was chairing the rhino tech from its beginning, and I have to confess that these animals are still my not yet reached love for my zoo. So, Simon. I started my zoo career on the 1st of June 1980. Now this is a sad thing for two reasons. One is that I actually remember the date and that confirms that yes, I'm a nerd, blah blah. The other one is that most of you in this room were probably not even born then. So some of the things I'm gonna talk about is kind of ancient history. I was privileged to join the keeping staff at the world famous Jersey Zoo. It was famous then, it's more famous now. I like to think I was part of a cohort of keepers who really achieved extraordinary things and took that zoo forward. Uh, many of those keepers that I worked with are still great colleagues, great friends. Many of them are in this room now. But there was one that I bonded with particularly uh, because we both shared a passion for the game of rugby, game rugby union to be precise. Now rugby, for those of you who don't live in countries that play the game, is the world's most violent team sport. Injury is certain. Serious injury is quite likely. It is a game for thugs, hooligans, and petty criminals, which is probably why the French are so good at it. <laughs> kidding, guys, kidding, the English are better. Yeah, yeah. Nick was captain of the local rugby team. He was actually a revered captain of the local rugby team. He was a warrior and a leader. Yes, it's an aggressive game, so I guess he was an aggressive person on the field. But actually, there's a completely different side to him. Because, like many, in my experience, many very big men, and this will mean nothing to you aggressive little short people out there, for very big men can often be extraordinarily gentle. And he was a fantastic animal keeper with great empathy, with great sympathy, with fantastic hand rearing skills. Real uh, role model for the uh, likes of, of me coming up. Um, like all of us at Jersey, he carried out field work in, in places like Panama and Jamaica and uh, developed the animal collection and our field co uh, connections. He then went on from Jersey to work for the Zoological Society of London. He went to manage their uh, field station in Saudi Arabia at Thamama. Uh, and here he was working with a completely different suite of animals, uh, gazelles mostly, um, building up an extraordinary collection, extraordinary numbers of animals. And working with Frank Rietkirk, our colleague who has now departed back to the Middle East and is, is much missed from our community at the moment. And he and Frank and others set about uh, establishing an extraordinary collection of animals there. And he developed a very broad range of husbandry skills, great, great knowledge, great insight. Uh, which he brought back to uh, Whipsnade when he came back, continuing to work uh, for ZSL. And he continued um, his career at Whipsnade as curator and as, um, as ever at ZSL. Um, roles changed, people changed, systems changed, and he evolved with that. Um, when he came back, uh, well, before he came back, he, he, um, and he was working in Saudi Arabia, he was telling me, uh, we all have our little place in history, and he was there in 1991 during the time of the first Gulf War. Uh, and he was talking to me once about how, being in Saudi Arabia, of course, they couldn't drink anything other than lemonade. Uh, but they used to sit outside their houses in the evening and watch the Scud missiles flying over from Iraq, heading towards Tel Aviv. That's an extraordinary moment in history to sort of be able to see that. And I've subsequently seen a photograph of him in a United States military convoy heading into Kuwait, all dressed up in the sort of, you know, the US Marines gear with the aviator shades and all the rest of it, looking, looking just the part, heading into Kuwait uh, to sort out the zoo in the first convoy that went in after the liberation of that country, the, the, the Gulf War. And that kind of set a pattern for Nick that um, he has had huge involvement in uh, extraordinary places, Afghanistan, Nepal, Iran. He's been to all those, those sorts of, of countries on zoo business, helping, advising, and developing good zoo practice. Um, 
Thomas has mentioned that in, within our community, he has, of course, been the, the uh, chair of the Rhino Tag. He's also worked um, extraordinarily well with many other tags. He's been a fixture in our community for, uh, well, the last 20 years, I guess, certainly since the, the tag and EEP system was set up. Latterly, of course, he's been part of the Technical Assistance Committee, otherwise known as the Grumpy Old Gits Committee, uh, of which there are a number I see in the room around me. Hi, Paul. Uh, <laughs> hi, Mario. Yeah. Um, I think his community has been the sort of bedrock of how our tag system has worked and I think the skills and the vision and the empathy that he has brought to us uh, makes him absolutely deserving for this Lifetime Achievement Award. He was, when I got married in 1985, he was my best man, he's still my best mate and it's a huge privilege and a pleasure to be able to give him this award. while I just top up. It's one thing, it's very nice to be presented something with your, by your best friend, but when he's one of the best speakers in Iaza history, <laughs> it's tough to follow. Thank you, Simon. Um, I don't know what to say. Talk, we, we, we've got to talk about past times, I suppose, because that's what us grumpy old gits do now. And I found many more growing, there's a growing co cohort these days in the Isles, and I thoroughly enjoy their company. Um, my first European meeting is probably in the days of ICASA. It was probably 35 years ago. It was in Malouze. It was the EEP meeting. They didn't have an, an annual conference in those days. There were, I don't know, 40 people there. It lasted for a day and a half. The language of the conference was German. Nothing's much changed, really, has it? All those years, all those years. But what what hasn't changed? What hasn't changed is I remember as a, a young keeper curator in those, those days that that day and a half, although I didn't understand a word of it um, until in the bar afterwards, was one of the most motivating and exciting experiences that I could have. Looking back on this week. Although, thank God, I no longer have to do the late nights, and I can remember two or three days back, is that I'm still getting the same excitement. I still get the same buzz of sitting in a room with now the next generation and the next generation, so we'll push on a bit, um, who are, who's taken you know, much of the, the dreams and the ambitions of that fir those first meetings, those early meetings, which includes talking about sparks and stud books, which again was, you know, um, and it still is. So I've not learned very much, sorry, Nate. But it's, but it, it's incredible to think the development that's gone on through IASA during that time. And for me, it's just been fun to be part of it. You know, it's not been a chore, it's not been a job. Um, I thank Jersey and, and ZSL for, for supporting me on that work, but it's just been good fun. And on the way, I've met some really inspiring people, many of you in this room here, um, some sadly no longer with us. Um, but others, um, Simon mentioned my work overseas, I've mentioned, met, met and worked with some of the most inspiring people in zoos and in other wildlife projects in some of the countries where resources are short, whether it is a, a tough existence and even tougher to try and make some sort of headway with the work that we do. And there are people who are out there and make that commitment and do it with a smile on their face. And what I find particularly gratifying, I suppose, is that the work that you now do um, is going a long way to supporting those people and help them achieve their goals in wildlife conservation. And I think that's something which IASA and everybody who's been connected to that, their partners, should be very proud of. Thank you all for this. Um, good luck in the future. I'll be watching you.
Vielen Dank, Nick. We can do this with the language. So. Last but not least, a colleague who has just left the senior position in Bristol Zoo will be honored by his longtime colleague at Bristol, Christoph Schwitzer. Not being a primate spe specialist, I will always remember Brian, Carol, as the one who told me that there is a difference between marmosets and tamarinds. Thank you for that. <laughs> right, hello everybody. I have the great honor to speak about Brian now. Um, uh, let me start with, a, with an anecdote. Uh, when Brian had just appointed me as research officer um, at Bristol Zoo in 2006, just before I actually went over to Bristol, um, I was still in Cologne. I was used to the tight regime of Gunter Nogge there at Cologne Zoo. Um, and uh, I spoke to Lydia Colter, who was just on this stage a couple of minutes ago, and I said to her, I'm going to Bristol. And she said to me, oh, you're going to Bristol? Brian Carroll is there, isn't he? That's great. He's a great conservationist. You can go to Bristol. That's entirely fine. Go there. So that was uh, my first uh, impression of, of Brian, really, and, uh, and Bristol Zoo. Let me tell you a couple of facts about Brian. Brian grew up in Sutton Coldfield. Now, um, uh, for those of you who, like me, um, haven't grown up in the UK, you will probably think that Sutton Coldfield is some kind of infectious disease. No, it is actually, <laughs> it is actually a town somewhere near Birmingham. And uh, Brian told me that he roamed the local parks there and, uh, and looked for newts and frogs and toads and brought them home. When other boys brought their girlfriends home, he brought all of these animals home. <clears throat> he studied zoology and then did his PhD on Goldie's monkeys. Um, and then he became head of marmosets and bats at Jersey Zoo. I think that was in 1979. Um, he then became curator of mammals there later, and in 1995 started at Bristol Zoo, um, where he spent 23 years of his life, first as operations manager, then as deputy director, and since 2010 also as uh, CEO. Um, his career spent 39 years in the zoo community, which I think is a great achievement. Now, what did he do in all these years? Um, first of all, in our zoo in Bristol, um, he established the in-house veterinary department in 1999 and the conservation programs department a couple of years later. He then employed me as the first research officer, hence establishing a research department, very far-reaching. Um, he brought eye eyes and Livingston fruit, Livingston's fruit bats and also giant jumping rats to Bristol Zoo. Um, he allowed me to work in Madagascar, which I think was also a very far-reaching decision. And uh, finally, in 2013, he opened um, the Wild Place Project, which is our second zoo just a couple of miles away from Bristol. Um, in all of that, Brian has been um, uh, instrumental to all of these changes, and he has shown... Um, leadership, passion, and unfaltering conviction all along the way. Um, talking about the IASA community, Brian founded the IASA Bushmeat Working Group in 1999. He then chaired the IASA um, Bushmeat campaign, the very first IASA campaign ever, I believe. Um, and uh, that was very successful. Many of you will remember um, we collected uh, hundreds of thousands of signatures presented them to the European Parliament. That was really a great achievement. Um, ten years later, Brian chaired the uh, Great Ape Campaign then. Um, and um, he was instrumental in establishing the tradition of IASA campaigns um, to promote um, IASA's conservation work. Um, Brian was also a member of the IASA Council. He was a member of the EP Committee. And of course, he chaired the Calatricket Texan Advisory Group for many years, which um, has now been taken over, or actually a couple of years ago has been taken over by Eric and Miranda. Um, <clears throat> as chair of the IASA Conservation Committee, another great function that Brian had here in the IASA community, he has been a leading figure in establishing the tradition of the biennial IASA Conservation Forum, which I think has significantly increased Europe-wide collaboration in zoo-based conservation. 
<clears throat> Brian has al also coordinated some of the first collaborative species management programs, both on British and EASA and also on international level, among them um, some British Isle stud books um, for the white-faced sake. He was coordinator for Rodriguez fruit bats, Goldie's monkeys, of course, um, but also spectacled bear. He even authored a chapter in a book about spectacled bears. Um, and uh, Western lowland gorillas for a couple of years, eye eyes and Malagasy giant jumping rats. <clears throat> and I think in all of these roles, Brian has certainly played a major and lasting role in helping to shape the evolution of zoos into the 21st century. <clears throat> Brian has also established, um, very early actually, established professional links with the IUCN Species Survival Commission um, as part of different uh, specialist groups, thus bridging the gap that I think at the time may still have been perceived by many people between the field and the ex situ conservation communities. <clears throat> um, he's been an excellent boss to me over the last 12 years, uh, for which I'm very, very grateful, Brian. Um, and whenever I had a question, whenever I needed some mentoring, or I simply needed a day off to look after the children, Brian has always been very generous with his help. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. Um, when he retired at the end of July this year, after 23 years, I thought that many of us would miss him. In actual fact, we don't really need to miss him because he isn't quite gone yet. Uh, first of all, he is here. <laughs> and um, um, he hasn't vanished from the zoo community at all yet. In fact, he is um, taking over from Nick Lindsay, actually, the EEP for the Golden Lion Tamarind, thus going back a bit to his roots as head of marmosets, even though it's a tamarind. Um, <laughs> At, uh, at Jersey. Um, Brian will also have a couple of other functions within IASA and Bayaza still uh, with institutional support from Bristol Zoological Society and we haven't seen the last of him yet. So um, to say it with Albus Dumbledore, there is a time for lengthy speeches. This is not it. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Brian on his well-deserved IASA Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you very much. quite something. Um, I've got to make sure it doesn't fall off. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm incredibly honored with this award. It's, um, it's quite amazing, really. And um, having the things that I've done recounted by Christoph, um, it makes me feel very old as well. And also hearing about these people who started their zoo careers back when I started mine in 1976, actually. It's, uh, so, yeah, many of you were not born, you weren't thought of at that time. Um, but it's great to see you all here anyway. Um, I started working in zoos because, um, well, partly because I didn't really know what I wanted to do as a career, but I was passionate about animals, passionate about wildlife. Um, so I ended up working at Jersey Zoo, thankfully. And as Simon mentioned earlier, the cohort of people there, it was a great time to work there. And I think we, we fed each other's passion and knowledge and, um, and, and helped each other along the way. And I, one of the things about coming to these meetings and, and seeing EASA and, and how it has thrived and developed over the years it's being driven by people who are just as passionate as I was, as we were in those days. Um, and long may that passion continue. Um, passion isn't quite enough, though. It's, um, it also needs direction, and it needs 
strategic thinking and it needs teamwork. Christoph mentioned the bushmeat campaign. I was put on the spot back in 1999. I'd given a, I'd given a presentation about uh, the African bushmeat trade and its effect on the great ape populations. And um, on one of the plenaries, Bert de Boer, who was then chair, Kuhn Brower, who was director, um, they actually announced, I had no idea they were going to do this. They said, we think EASA should run a campaign. Brian, you'll run it, won't you? And, uh, you know, it's difficult to say no under those circumstances, but I was thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> um, because we'd never done it before. We had no idea what we were going to do. But um, with the office, with Kuhn and Kareen uh, Boss particularly from the office, the great ape tag, um, we set about um, putting together a campaign plan and implementing it and to me, it was one of the sort of greatest teams in EASA that I've ever seen and, and ever worked with. But it's also, um, you know, whether it's at taxon advisory group level or EEP committee, uh, the EEP committee, the species committees, these are all teams that work within teams and wheels that operate within wheels. And although EASA can sometimes seem big and bureaucratic at times, it needs that structure in order to thrive and survive. Um, and it was, like I say, it was absolutely incredible to see that develop. At the same time, um, with the research committee, the conservation committee, um, we've seen so many other developments. I'm really pleased to have been able to do what I've done with the Conservation Committee. It's now in, in very good hands with uh, Eric. Um, and that will go from strength to strength as well. But it's not all been serious, I have to say. Um, the serious work we do is great, and we are now a huge force for conservation and science. But actually also, we have a lot of fun, um, don't we? The, uh, it, it's about meeting people. It's about making friendships. It's about getting together in the bar afterwards. Uh, great parties like we had uh, the other night at, uh, at Attica Zoo. Thank you very much. Um, and there will also, I'm sure, be a great party tonight. Um, those things, um, it's those friendships um, that are forged that are so important as well. And I'm fortunate to have made many, many friends in the zoo world. Um, and also, I mean, I have to say that as a standout moment on the fun side, I'm old enough to remember the Cole Morden um, final party, where, um, which was quite stand out. It was, it was great, but I'm, I'm sure you'll have an equally good time tonight. AARS is huge now, complicated, and like I say, some say bureaucratic. Um, but I'll just come back to saying that, you know, we do collectively achieve great things. Um, and I'm sure that with the passion that's here in the room and the, and the commitment, um, AARS will go on to do great things, more great things. Um, as Christoph said, I'm not quite disappearing. I'll be around for quite a few years yet, I hope. Um, but I'm honored to have played my part um, in, it, in bringing Yaza to where it is today. But I would emphasize that it is because of the people around you who, you, who work with you um, that we manage to achieve things. So um, thank you for doing me this great honor. Um, I will treasure this very much indeed. Thank you very much. So dear colleagues, it feels like being yesterday that I welcomed you to this conference here in essence. Now, 
one annual general meeting, one council meeting, five plenaries, 50 posters, 10 workshops, and 110 sessions, including 45 texts and 17 committees later, this intense conference is almost at its end. Not to forget the perfect organized social events at the icebreaker and the zoo, and I think so also tonight, and the numerous side talks, lunch meetings, and evening meetings, out of which quite a few ended with breakfast in the next morning, at least that's what I heard. <laughs> Thanks for the exhibitors. Your corporate membership helps us a lot and to develop EASA. Thanks to our sponsors and supporting partners. Thanks to all of you for your preparation and for your enthusiasm. Thanks to the host, Jean-Jacques, and your wife. Thanks to Caroline for organizing. Um, and last but not least, <laughs> also a special thank to the local conference organizers convene. The convene team did a great job. The venue and the facilities have been great and the food was wonderful. The convene team did their utmost best to make sure we had a comfortable and joyful stay this week. I especially would like to mention and thank Katerina Efstadiadi, Niki Shatsiliya, Shatsil, I, I already tried to do it earlier already, Ageliki Kisa, and Georgia Caterino, and Georgia Menti. Last but not least, we have to thank our EASA executive office team for the per and perfectly led by our director, Mafanvi Griffiths. Thank you very much for your work. I will close the official part of this conference with my best wishes, uh, wishes to all of you for your, uh, and for the coming year. Stay dedicated to your work and at your zoo and your voluntary ASA involvement. And I am already looking forward to seeing all of you at our next on, uh, annual conference, which we held in Valencia. And now I would like to uh, that Jean-Jacques Lesseur please come up and the director from Biopark Valencia, Luis Achel Ruiz, please come to stage. I, yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to have just a few words and to say how inspiring it has been for all of us to host this conference, <clears throat> especially for my staff and for myself, uh, for all the, for my daughter, who was the, really the person behind all this organization. And I think uh, we, we must also appreciate the fact that we were chosen to host this conference, and I hope that uh, Valencia will have the same feelings and uh, experience as we had. It's been a very <laughs> easy conference. <laughs> and um, I have a, a little, uh, do you, you prefer the red, or the, the red or the green color? Red, okay, so you will wear this hat. <laughs> I will wear the green, and then maybe our inspiration will reach Valencia, and uh, you will end like I'm ending today.
is an excellent conference this year. Congratulations. And anything, here you are our invitation, and I hope to see you all next year in Valencia. Thank you so much. No, stay here, stay here. No, stay here. We will see a short video from Valencia. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, yeah. The protection of biodiversity starts sometimes thousands of miles away from the ecosystems we try to protect, transforming some major cities into wilderness sanctuaries. In the heart of Valencia, a modern and touristic city, we find one of these sanctuaries, a place to get lost into a faithful reproduction of some of the most beautiful and endangered African landscapes. Biopark is a project promoted by Rainforest, a Spanish company specialized in the design, construction and management of new, innovative zoologic fully committed with conservation and education. Under these guidelines at Rainforest, we have designed and built two of the most successful zoo immersion animal parks, Biopark Fungirola and Biopark Valencia. The goal of zoo immersion is to transmit to the visitor the sensation of being in direct contact with the wilderness by recreating complete ecosystems with multiple species. These ecosystems are those that are currently at risk and that we try to protect. Contemplating wild animals in their own habitat is a unique, thrilling experience for our visitors that makes them more receptive to our conservation messages. Our mission is to raise awareness among our visitors about protecting our planet's biodiversity. We are convinced of the power of people to change things and get a habitable planet for everyone, people and animals. Rainforest is a member of IASA since the foundation of each park more than 10 years ago. We participate in more than 40 EEPs and ESBs with newborns from very representative species like gorillas, chimpanzees, giraffes, bongos, and we lead some of them. Because we believe that it can't be justified to maintain species in captivity if we don't help in the preservation of the original habitat, rainforests participate through the Biopark Foundation in important international conservation projects in situ. So, we are very excited to extend to you our invitation to come to Valencia for the 2019 ESA conference and enjoy our Biopark and all the attractiveness of our city. So, just before you go, a couple of housekeeping news. For the gala dinner tonight, we are expected to be at the main entrance of this Megaron venue between 1845 and 19, um, 1900 hours. The dinner will be at the Forest Museum, a little away from the city center at the foot of the Mount Hymettus in a scenic setting. We will be treated to Greek special, uh, specialities. You can join in a mini tour through the museum and there will be a folkloric dancing group, of course, a DJ later that evening. Departure back to the city will start at 11 o'clock and runs until one o'clock uh, uh, Sunday morning. Drop off is here at the conference play, uh, venue. Very important, please make sure that you bring your name tag tonight because otherwise you don't get in and you don't get food. And please make sure um, at the venue, be at the venue on time because the buses, the buses don't wait and also make sure to bring your jacket or coat. We will have dinner inside the museum, but it can get chilly in the countryside, even in Greece in these days. So dear colleagues, thank you again to the host and dear colleagues, I see you tonight and I wish you all the best for the coming year.